We're talking about the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and we've been looking at the fundamental facts that any adequate historical hypothesis needs to explain. And the first of these, I argued, um, was uh, for the, in support of the empty tomb, uh, namely the burial account of Jesus is historically reliable. And we saw that the burial account has a number of lines of evidence that suggest that indeed Jesus was buried by this member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea, and that this goes to support the historicity of the empty tomb. Now today we come to the second line of evidence in support of the historicity of the empty tomb. You'll remember we saw that the burial account is multiply attested in very early independent sources. And the same is true of the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. And so our second line of evidence concerns the early independent attestation of the fact of Jesus' empty tomb. Now you remember that the burial account of Jesus was um, to be found in the pre-Marcan passion story, the passion source that Mark used in writing his gospel, and that the burial of Jesus was also summarized and referred to in that pre-Pauline formula that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15. And exactly the same is true of the empty tomb. First of all, the pre-Marcan passion source in all probability did not end with the burial story, but it also included the story of the women's discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. In fact, the burial story and the empty tomb story are really one story, not two. They are a smooth, continuous narrative, and they're linked by grammatical and, his, uh, grammatical and uh, linguistic ties. So, for example, if you look at the empty tomb account, you'll find that the antecedent to the word him in verse 1 of chapter 16, where it says they brought spices that they might go and anoint him, the antecedent to that is found in the burial story, namely uh, Jesus in 15 verse 43, where it says that Joseph of Arimathea took courage and asked for the body of Jesus, and then in 16.1 the women go to anoint him. Um, similarly, the women's discussion in uh, chapter 16.1-8 about who's going to move the stone that is over the door of the tomb presupposes the burial account of the large stone that Joseph of Arimathea had rolled across the entrance of the tomb and sealed. Similarly, the women's knowing where the location of the tomb was presupposes what it says in 1547 that Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where Jesus was laid. They noted the location of the tomb and so knew where to go to anoint the body. And similarly, the words of the angel in 16, um, uh, verse um, 6 and following, he is not here, see the place where they laid him, that refers back to 15, verse 46, where it says that J uh, Joseph of Arimathea laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock. So I think you can see that grammatically and linguistically, these two stories are really one story. They are one smooth account of what happened to Jesus following his crucifixion. Moreover, it is in any case highly unlikely that early Christians would have uh, circulated a story of Jesus' passion which simply ended with his burial. That would be to end in death and defeat. And the passion story is incomplete without victory at the end. You need to have the empty tomb in order to bring the passion story to an appropriate climax. And so the pre-Mark and passion story probably included, and it may have ended with the story of the discovery of the empty tomb. It's very interesting 
that the Gospels are harmonious right up through the discovery of the empty tomb. And it's after that that they begin to diverge in adding or appending to it uh, different appearance stories uh, such as they prefer. And so then you have a divergence of the appearance stories. But they're uh, all on the same page right up through the discovery of the empty tomb. So the empty tomb account, like the burial story, is part of this extremely early source called the Premark and Passion story. Secondly, you remember we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, <laughs> verses 3 to 5, Paul is quoting from an extremely early four-line tradition that refers to Jesus' burial and resurrection. Now, in this four-line formula, the empty tomb is not explicitly mentioned. But you remember how we compared the four lines of that formula to the passion narrative on the one hand and the apostolic preaching in the book of Acts on the other hand. And we saw that just as the second line of the saying, he was buried, corresponds to the burial story, the third line, he was raised on the third day, corresponds to the story of the discovery of the empty tomb. And so this concourse of independent traditions, I think, shows convincingly that the third line of the formula is, in fact, a summary of the empty tomb narrative. And Paul's expression, he was raised, um, echoes the words of the angel in the pre-Mark and Passion story, he is risen. In both cases, you have the proclamation of the resurrection. Moreover, there are two other aspects of this pre-Pauline formula or tradition that plausibly imply the empty tomb. First, the expression, he was raised following the expression, he was buried, implies an empty grave. The idea that a man could be dead and buried and raised from the dead, and yet his corpse still remain in the tomb, would have been absolute nonsense to a first century Jew. For first century Jews, the resurrection is the physical raising up of the remains of the dead person uh, in the grave. And so there's no question that in the thinking of a first century Jew, the tomb of Jesus would have been empty. E. E. Ellis, who is a prominent New Testament scholar, remarks, and I quote, it is very unlikely that the earliest Palestinian Christians could conceive of any distinction between resurrection and physical grave emptying resurrection. To them, an anastasis, that is a resurrection, without an empty grave would have been about as meaningful as a square circle, virtually a contradiction in terms. And so when the pre-Pauline tradition affirms that Christ was buried and he was raised, it automatically implies that an empty grave was left behind. And given the early date and the provenance of this tradition coming out of the mother church in Jerusalem, its drafters could not have believed such a thing if the tomb had not at that time been empty. In addition to that, secondly, the expression on the third day, I think, implies the empty tomb. Paul's tradition says, and he was raised on the third day. Very briefly summarized, since nobody actually saw Jesus rise from the dead, no one actually saw him get up and come out of the tomb, why did the early disciples date the resurrection on the third day? Why not on the seventh day, for example? Well, I think that the most likely answer is that it was on the third day after the crucifixion that the women discovered the tomb of Jesus empty. And so naturally, the resurrection came to be dated on that day. It was the date of the discovery of the empty tomb. And so this expression, on the third day, I think is plausibly a time indicator for 
the time of the women's visit to the tomb and their discovery of the empty tomb. So we have then extraordinarily early evidence, independent evidence, for the fact of Jesus' empty tomb, both in the pre-Markan Passion story and then also in the pre-Pauline formula quoted in 1 Corinthians 15. And what that implies, therefore, is that the discovery of the empty tomb of Jesus cannot just be written off as some late developing legend. The traditions are too early to allow that to be the case. But again, there's more to this story because once again we have good reason to think that there are other independent sources behind the other Gospels and Acts as well. Matthew, for example, is clearly working with an independent source uh, in addition to the Gospel of Mark because Matthew relates the story of the guard at the tomb, which is not found in the Gospel of Mark. Moreover, there are traces uh, in this story uh, of prior tradition in the non Matthean vocabulary of this story. Uh, this story has a number of words or expressions which are in fact unique in all of the New Testament. Uh, expressions like on the next day, the preparation day, deceiver, guard, uh, to make secure, to seal. These are expressions that are not simply unusual for Matthew, but these are vocabulary and expressions that aren't found anywhere else in the New Testament. And this is indicative, I think, of uh, prior tradition that Matthew is here handing on and working with. In general, it's very interesting that when you look at the empty tomb stories in Matthew uh, and in Mark, um, Matthew's story has 138 words. Mark's has 136 words. And of Mark's 136 words, only 35 of them are to be found um, in the Gospel of Matthew. So obviously Matthew is not simply reproducing Mark here. Uh, he's got some independent source of information that he's using to supplement what he learns from Mark. Now, in addition to this, there is also indication uh, that Matthew is responding to a prior tradition in his comment in Matthew 28, 15 about the guard story. He says, this story has been spread among Jews until this day. This story has been spread among Jews until this day. This shows that Matthew is responding to a well-known uh, Jewish uh, counter-explanation of the fact of the empty tomb. And so Matthew is working here with a prior uh, tradition. He's not just writing out of whole cloth. 2815 is the um, Matthean comment that this story, that is the story that the disciples stole the body, uh, that's been spread among Jews to this day. So this is a prior tradition, and Matthew is responding to it. Now, in addition to this, Luke also has plausibly an independent source in addition to Mark. We know this because Luke tells the story, which is again not to be found in Mark, of two disciples uh, verifying the report of the women that the tomb was in fact vacant. Luke reports that two of the disciples run to the tomb to verify that in fact the body is missing. And he doesn't get this from Mark because it's not in Mark. Neither can you say, well, Luke just invented this, that he made it up because the visit of the two disciples to the tomb is also found in John, which is independent of Luke. Luke didn't know John's gospel. So you have independent attestation of the disciples' visit to the tomb in both Luke and John, which shows again that Luke is using another source in addition to Mark. And again, in general, um, of the 
123 words that are found in Luke's account of the empty tomb, he shares only 16 words with Mark, which again, I think, confirms that he's, doing, he's dealing here with more than just the Mark and empty tomb story. So that behind both Matthew and Luke, we also have other independent early sources for the fact of the empty tomb. Finally, given John's independence of the synoptics, remember we said that John is independent of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that gives us yet another independent source for the empty tomb. Um, finally, the apostolic sermons in the book of Acts once again have indirect references to the fact of Jesus' empty tomb. For example, in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 32, Acts chapter 2, 29 to 32, Peter draws this sharp contrast. He says, David died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, but this Jesus God raised up. And clearly the contrast there is that although David's tomb is with us to this day, uh, Jesus' tomb is no longer occupied. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Or if you look at Acts chapter 13, verses 36 to 37, again we have the, uh, an allusion to the empty tomb. For David, after he had served the counsel of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. So implying there that Jesus' body was raised from the tomb. Now historians think that they have hit historical pay dirt when they have just two early independent sources for some event. But in the case of the empty tomb, we have an abundance of early independent sources, no fewer than six. Uh, and some of these are among the very earliest materials uh, to be found in the New Testament. And this, I think, provides uh, very good evidence for the historical credibility of the discovery of the empty tomb. Any questions or comments on that second line of evidence in support of the empty tomb? I'm curious, what are the source, have the sources been identified for those that are predating Luke or Matthew? None of these sources exist in documentary form. In fact, they might have been oral, especially the pre-Pauline tradition behind 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5. This may have simply been a memorized early uh, tradition that was then passed on orally. So when I speak of sources here, I'm not talking about documentary sources. Rather, these are the traditions and sources upon which the New Testament authors drew in writing their Gospels. This is extremely important. People will often demand from you uh, extra-biblical sources to show that, for example, the tomb was found empty or, or Jesus was buried. What evidence is there outside the New Testament to ratify these things? Well, by the very nature of the case, any later sources from outside the New Testament will be derivative and secondary, and therefore less reliable to the, than the primary sources themselves. But when we're talking about the sources that the New Testament authors themselves used, these are the real sources outside the New Testament that are historically significant, because these are even earlier and more primitive then the Gospels and the letters of Paul, these are the sources upon which these authors drew. And so if you can show that an event or saying in the life of Jesus uh, is multiply and independently attested in these very early sources, then you are on very secure historical ground. Yes, Bruce? Well, there's testimony from the negative. You don't see in general literature people denying that the tomb was empty. You no, that, that's right, and that's fair too. Um, yes, that's right. It's not until later that you get 
um, critics like Celsus in the second century attacking the Gospels. Um, so that, that's, that's true. All right, let's go to our third line of evidence in support of the historicity of the empty tomb narrative, and that is that the phrase, the first day of the week, reflects very ancient tradition. The phrase, the first day of the week, reflects a very early primitive tradition. Notice that Mark 16.1, um, or actually 16.2, and very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb. Now, we've already seen that the Christian tradition, which Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15, is extremely early and dates the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures says the pre-Pauline tradition. And yet in Mark, the empty tomb narrative does not say on the third day they came to the tomb, but rather on the first day of the week. As the New Testament scholar E.L. Bode explains, if the empty tomb story were a late developing legend, then it would almost certainly have been formulated in terms of the by then widely accepted and uh, prominent third day motif. The fact that Mark uses instead the expression on the first day of the week confirms that his tradition is extremely primitive. It antedates even the third day reckoning, which is itself extremely early. And I think this fact is confirmed by the linguistic character of the phrase in question. For even though the uh, phrase is very awkward in Greek, the first day of the week in uh, Greek is temia, ton, sabaton. And this is very awkward in Greek. Mia is not a, an ordinal number, it's a cardinal number. It literally means the one of the week, not the first of the week, the one of the week. And then instead of using the week, it uses the word for Sabbath, uh, sabbaton. So this expression is awkward in Greek, but when you retranslate it back into Aramaic, it turns out to be perfectly idiomatic and natural Aramaic. And what this suggests is that this phrase reflects the original language spoken by the disciples in Jerusalem. It is a, a, an Aramaic uh, tradition and expression uh, and thus makes this tradition very primitive and very early and that again reduces the plausibility of the hypothesis of late developing legend. Any comment about this point concerning the expression the first day of the week? in the empty tomb story. Just what it, exactly is the literal Aramaic of... I the, thought you might ask that. As I recall, it's Bekath B'Shabatha. Bekath B'Shabatha is the Aramaic. Uh, in Hebrew, it would be Bechad B'Shabat. Um, so it's, it's good Aramaic, uh, but it's awkward Greek. I wonder how John Mazzatelli will transcribe that when he <laughs> does his today's lesson. <laughs> All right, finally, let's go to point four. This is our fourth line of evidence in support of the historicity of the empty tomb. And that is that the Markan story is simple and lacks any signs of legendary development or embellishment. It's a very simple story lacks any signs of legendary development. Like the burial account, Mark's account of the discovery of the empty tomb is extremely restrained. Uh, it is unembellished by any of the theological or apologetic motifs that you would expect to characterize a later legendary account. For example, it is remarkable when you think about it 
that the resurrection of Jesus is not witnessed or described. Uh, the temptation to describe the resurrection of Jesus is almost irresistible. Um, in passion plays, like one that was held here at our church several years ago, on Easter morning, uh, in the Passion Play, the, the stone over the tomb rolls back by itself. And in blinding floodlights, Jesus comes out of the tomb, triumphantly risen from the dead. It's just almost irresistible to describe or portray Jesus' resurrection on Sunday morning. And yet, in the Mark and account, this isn't done at all. They just go to the tomb and find it empty. And the stone rolled away. There is no reflection theologically on Jesus' triumph over sin and death. There's no use of Christological titles of Jesus in the story. There's no quotation of fulfilled prophecy in the story. There's no description of the risen Lord, uh, such as you might have in the Transfiguration, for example. So the story is incredibly restrained and straightforward, which I think uh, shows that we have a narrative here that is very primitive. Now, to appreciate this point, all you have to do is compare Mark's account to the accounts of the empty tomb found in the later apocryphal Gospels. For example, the Gospel of Peter is a forgery from the second half of the second century after Christ. And in the Gospel of Peter, the tomb is not only surrounded by a Roman guard, it's explicitly identified as Roman, not only by a Roman guard, but also by all of the Pharisees and the elders and the chief priests and a huge crowd from the surrounding countryside who have come to watch the tomb. Suddenly, during the night, a voice rings out from heaven and two men are seen descending out of the clouds. The stone over the door of the tomb rolls back by itself and the two men descend out of heaven and go into the tomb. Then three men are seen coming out of the tomb. Two of the men are so gigantic that their heads reach up to the clouds. But the head of the third man overpasses the clouds. He's so huge. Then a voice cries from heaven, hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross, oh, oh, I forgot, a cross then follows them out of the tomb. After the three men, a cross comes out of the tomb. The voice from heaven says, hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, yay. <laughs> now, this is how real legends look. They're embellished with all sorts of theological and apologetical motifs, motifs which are conspicuously lacking from the Barkin account. In contrast to these, Mark's account is stark in its simplicity, and I think that bespeaks the earliness and the primitiveness of the tradition that Mark relates. All right, I'm sure you're already seeing how these lines of evidence reinforce one another like a hand in a glove, the primitiveness of the first day of the week expression, along with the earliness of the pre-Mark and Passion story, and then the uh, simplicity of the narrative. All of these go to suggest that we're not dealing here with later legend or myth, but we're on, in touch with a, a, a first century uh, early historical account of what happened on that day uh, after the crucifixion. So let's close now shall we, with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we've been able to consider these well-established truths related in the gospel and in the rest of the New Testament. We pray that you would seal these to our heart and produce in us a holy confidence in the veracity of your word and in the truth of the empty tomb and Jesus' resurrection, in whose name we pray, amen.